Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Bible contains remarkable stories of miracles and divine interventions. Moses parted the sea. Peter healed a man lame from his mother's womb. Jesus drove demons out of people and raised others from the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? We too have a beam of divine light and guidance that God has put within the heart of every man. And it's one of the greatest proofs that there is a God. More amazing supernatural things are happening than we realize. This is Divine Intervention, the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. Divine Intervention was created and produced with the purpose of encouraging believers, spiritual seekers, and skeptics alike that Jesus is alive and is still performing miracles and working in the world today. I believe in miracles. Here's your host, Daniel Fazina. Hello, friend, and welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. That's right, I am your host, Daniel Fazina, and I am so grateful that you're taking some time out of your busy day to spend with me. I hope to encourage you on this show and let you know that God is real, and I'm very honored and privileged and humbled to be able to bring you another exciting testimony of what the Lord is doing in someone's life. You know, he's still doing miracles today, not just in the times of when the Bible was written, but today. And that's the reason why I do this show, Divine Intervention. I want to showcase the miracle testimonies, the conversion experiences, and all sorts of ways that God is still working in the world today. Friend, today's guest is an amazing man. He's got quite an interesting background, and he comes from the country of Iran. uh, And he was actually active and and lived there during the 1979 Islamic Revolution in that country. Before I get to him, though, I would like to invite you to visit our website, divineinterventionradio.com. If you miss any of the shows, you can check out the archives there. I've got uh, many, many episodes there. I've done, gosh, over... 250 episodes so far of the show. So there's testimonies of all kinds, from miracle healings to answered prayers, near-death experiences, conversions, uh, you name it. There's just about something for everybody there. Um, So I hope you go to the website and check it out, divineinterventionradio.com. You can also find the shows on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash divineinterventionradio. When you go there, please like and subscribe to the channel. That would really help us to grow the show and get the word out about what the Lord is doing still today. Uh, Our Facebook page is facebook.com forward slash Divine Intervention Radio. And you can also connect with me, if you like, on Twitter uh, directly. Uh, Daniel Fazina 1 is my handle. So at Daniel Fazina, the numeral 1 on twitter.com. Okay, friends, let's get to our special guest. His name is Dr. Daniel Shiesta. And he wrote the book, The House I Left Behind, A Journey from Islam to Christ. Now, Dr. Shiesta was raised a practicing Muslim in Iran, as I mentioned. Uh, While studying in Tehran, he became involved in the Iranian Islamic Revolution and went on to become a leading Muslim politician and teacher of Islamic religious philosophy in northern Iran. In the second year after the revolution, he fell out of favor with the Ayatollah Khomeini's political group. Kidnapped by the revolutionary military, he was placed on death row awaiting execution. He was miraculously released and eventually escaped to Turkey, where through a business relationship which went wrong, he came to know a group of Christians and through them, Jesus Christ. Dr. Shiesta's story offers a compelling picture of life in Iran after the revolution, and he provides unique insights into the interactions between Iranian culture and fundamentalist Islam, a devastating critique of the Iranian revolution, and a warning to the world about radical Islam. I had the opportunity to read his book, The House I Left Behind, A Journey from Islam to Christ, and it is a riveting read, very interesting, uh, fascinating look into the politics and behind the scenes of Iran during the revolutionary time period. So uh, I recommend you do pick it up. Uh, You can find more about Daniel Shiesta on his website, exodusfromdarkness.org. That's www.exodusfromdarkness.org. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Daniel Shiesta right now on Divine Intervention Radio. Dr. Shiesta, welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. 
Oh, great. Well, you know, I'm very excited to hear your story. Uh, I got a taste of it from watching some videos online, and I had a chance to uh, read your book, The House I Left Behind, A Journey from Islam to Christ. And I have to say it's fascinating, a riveting read, and uh, quite a testimony you have. Uh, And we definitely want to get to everything that happened in your life. But before we get to the full story, why don't you take us to the beginning? Tell us what it was like for you growing up. I understand you grew up in Iran in a, um, a Muslim household. What was that like for you? Yes, uh, my father had two wives and 12 children. We were all living together. I was the one uh, from childhood uh, encouraged very much to uh, learn about Islam, memorize the Quran, and learn about Islamic rituals. Hmm. I became a famous boy at the age of nine, and people called me uh, to the different religious ceremonies, so I performed some Islamic rituals and recited the Quran for them. And so, um, I, since I was very uh, busy with learning Islam, so I learned from childhood that Islam should be the only dominant religion in the world, and the Muslims need to try their best to establish it. Um, so I, that much I was active, you know, um, but I really didn't know about radical Islam. After I entered university, there I became a radical Muslim and followed Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini, um, Khomeini's model was Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. And so uh, uh, he wanted to establish the you know, Islamic uh, theocracy in Iran. He hated the King of Iran because the King of Iran accepted Israel as a country. So uh, according to um, Islamic law, he had to be killed. Oh, wow. And, but we, our opposition to the king, Shah of Iran, was because of political and social injustice. And uh, gradually we were uh, drawn to Ayatollah and accepted him as a leader. Or oh, eventually... Uh, uh, we forced the king of Iran, left the country, and captured the country, and uh, then Ayatollah started to rule the country by Islamic law. I remember seeing this on television. I was a small child. I was maybe four years old, sitting on my father's lap and uh, watching the footage of people protesting in the streets of Iran, and my father said, hey, you know, the Shah of Iran... Uh, was deposed and he he fled the country and I said well is that a good thing I was like yeah. well he was like no because the Shah was a friend of America um, but going back to what you said about you were practicing Islam but didn't know about radical Islam until college you mentioned in your book that the Persian people never fully really accepted Islam in its Arabic form they were more of um, a people who had a tradition of kings great kings like Cyrus and uh, yeah. uh, and others um, can you tell us about that dynamic of, of the Persian people's identity? Iranian people are very patriotic, really. No matter what they have, they put the country and their culture first. And even though they call themselves Muslim, but many of them do not know that uh, their culture actually dominant in some areas. And so for that reason, they had never... Um, any, any good relationship with Saudi Arabia in the past, you know, mm-hmm. because Islam came from Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia came and captured Iran, uh, you know, burned a lot of libraries and burned a lot of ancient things. So that is there. And, uh, and so uh, it is not easy to make Iranian radical Muslim this, you know, Ayatollah's possibly have just 1% or 2% of people, they are paying a lot to them, and sometimes even they employ foreign people like Lebanese and Afghans uh, to be their soldiers, you know, religious guards, uh, to kill their people, because Iranians normally avoid killing their own people. Mm. And so that's the case. In that time, I was, you know, back in Iran, the idea of Shah really was dominant everywhere, and especially the northern part of Iran, um, was the center of uh, tourism, you know, being uh, situated just by the Caspian Sea and uh, and also Shah's birthplace, you know, father's place. And uh, so it was uh, very significant uh, for people. They were more kingdom-oriented than Islamic-oriented. I mean, I, I even didn't know 
really what is the what was the obligation of a Muslim towards a religious leader, and uh, so I learned that after I entered the the university, mm. and I tell you, even after Shah left the country, the northern part of Iran was mourning almost predominantly for Shah, but you know because the army joined the Ayatollah Khomeini, so the country lost its power. Right. And the Shah, you know, Shah mean is I guess that's a word that means king. Is that right or leader? Yes, it's it's a Persian word for king. Okay, and there's a long history of kings and kingdoms in Persia, obviously. Um, so the Ayatollah Khomeini comes in Khomeini, and uh, he wants to establish what you thought, according to reading your book, was justice and um, freedom from oppression and, and more liberty. But that turned out to be not the case. Um, I interviewed another gentleman from Iran who, who also grew up in that time, and he said that he was fighting, you know, yelling in the streets, chanting "Death to America." And then when when the Shah left and the Ayatollah took power, he realized within two weeks that they had been had, that things were not as they were uh, promised. I was like, in two weeks, that was all it took. He said, "Yeah." Well, what was your experience after the, uh, you know, the Shah left and the Ayatollah came to power? Yeah, I mean, uh, from actually from the his right, from the, the first week, we realized that the voices of the clergy surrounding Ayatollah Khomeini uh, were not at all about unity. They were just trying to do something. You know, that was the voice of tension. We were surprised, and Ayatollah actually was keeping a little bit quiet, but he, we didn't know that he was manipulating us to uh, make the opposition you know, uh, voices strong. I mean, opposition voices, I'm just meaning the clergy, you know, were around him and uh, trying to establish, to build oppositions for themselves, in a sense. And so he is right. I mean, gradually we saw that he had promised the Iranians not to take any political position and not any clergy, but clergy was rushing to take political positions and putting pressure on the interim government. We were just fully shocked. And, you know, um, actually I was one of the first uh, ones uh, invited to start the Revolutionary Army in Iran. And then when I saw the situation there, and gradually I just withdrew from it, and I didn't want to get involved in it because we saw that Ayatollah and the clergy around him, surrounding him, were just, you know, telling lie to people and, uh, you know, uh, ignoring the promises they had already given to Iranian people. Hmm. Amazing. Now, growing up where you did in northern Iran, did you have any contact with Christians? Did you know any Christians? Um, and why do you think there was this perceived, uh, well, at least from our perspective, this perceived hatred towards Christians and the West in, in Iran? Yeah, the, the northern part of Iran was ruled many years, even centuries, by uh, Iranian Turks. Iranian Turks are the uh, group that made Islam as the formal religion in the world, in other words. Okay. And so they hated Christians, and especially uh, you have heard that huge massacre in Turkey by Turks. You know, they killed a lot of Armenian people. Right. So... That became a dominant culture in the northern part of Iran, uh, which is partly Iranian Turks and also those uh, uh, Persian nations who live by the Caspian Sea. So the word Christianity and word Jew were used as uh, swear words in the area. You know, if you if you uh, fought with a, another Muslim, you call that Muslim son of Christian or son of Jew. Hmm. And uh, wow. there was not any there was not any church in the area, so we didn't know anything about Christianity except uh, you know what Quran teaches and Islamic tradition tradition teaches that they are corrupt people, they are the most immoral people in the world, and they are corrupting and polluting the world, Jews and Christians. Hmm. Wow. Well, you said you grew up as a practicing Muslim and you learned early on from the Quran and you know Islamic teaching, but. You you didn't realize, or you didn't learn radical Islam until university. Can you tell me what the difference is? What did you learn at home or in your village versus what you learned in, in university? 
Yeah, in, at home, we, despite, you know, learning a lot of things about Islam, and even clergy didn't dare to speak against the Shah. So uh, the general mindset was, yes, we are Muslim, but under the authority of Shah, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, in the university, we learned that if you're a Muslim, you need to practice the Quran, you know? What is the Quran? Quran says that every aspect of life should be uh, religious fundamentally and uh, you know uh, if Shah is uh, uh, not a practicing Muslim then he's an infidel and especially when he has accepted Israel as a country you know and he's building relationship with Western unclean Christians and so he does not deserve to rule over the country so that's what we learned gradually in the university that uh, the country should be ruled by a Muslim person. And then the problem was we didn't know that Islam was not compatible. It's not compatible with freedom and that freedom Ayatollah Khomeini was, you know, uh, promising Iranian people because we didn't know Islam deeply, especially Islamic political, social, and ethical philosophy. And especially when you're in Iran, you're following especially a holy leader, you know, a supreme leader, religious leader, you imitate 100%. So whatever he translates, whatever he teaches, that's it. And so he just said that, yeah, after he uh, takes over and uh, people, you know, will have freedom, he promised us. And uh, we didn't know Islam deeply, that Islam... uh, is against the individual freedom because Islamic law says if God, Allah, has decided for you, the Prophet of Islam has already made, you know, values established law for you, then you don't need to think and decide. Oh, wow. Know that. That's, so uh, we just <laughs> simply, like, blind people imitated Ayatollah Khomeini until the time that we discovered that he denied all his promises, ignored them, and... Uh, you know, realize, especially when I was taken to prison and many other people were taken to prison and slaughtered and tortured, and then we realized that absolutely this theocracy is nothing to do with uh, individual freedom. Wow, that is very intense, crazy stuff. Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and our special guest is Dr. Daniel Shayesta. His website is exodusfromdarkness.org. And he's telling us about his life uh, in Iran, both prior to and after the revolution of 1979. Dr. Shayesta, you mentioned that Islam is not compatible with personal freedom. And I wanted to ask you, why do you think that is? I mean, I've I've also – I've asked other Muslims and former Muslims, you know, do you believe in freedom of religion? Are you allowed to choose Islam or can you choose another religion? Can you choose to follow Jesus? Can you choose to be a Buddhist or whatever? And um, I don't know. I don't get very satisfactory answers a lot of times. Can you address that issue? Well, I mean, in the Quran it's written that if you leave the religion, uh, you have to be killed. If you, you know, leave the religion, Islam, you're starting a war against all Muslim nations in the world, and uh, an Islamic law concerning war is this. If uh, you are starting a war against me, I need to get rid of you. And uh, that's, you know, a, a part of Islam. The second thing is, the um, Quran is very different to the Bible. In the Bible, the Bible says to you, if a prophet is speaking to you, just uh, evaluate it and see whether he is speaking the truth or not. And if he doesn't speak the truth, do not follow him. And even God, you know, is calling you to reason with him. In other words, God doesn't want to, call, you know, follow him blindly. But the case in the Quran is different. You know, Quran chapter 33, verse, verse 36 says that nobody has right to uh, give his opinion against the, you know, decision of Muhammad. Mm. Especially if you read Quran chapter 8, and if you do that, you are tortured, you are killed in a very horrible way in Quran chapter 8. And so the Islamic leadership, uh, starting from Allah, you know, uh, coming down to Muhammad and also all other people who are uh, leading Islamic nations in Muhammad's place, 
is that nobody has right, you know, to object to leadership. So it's an authoritarian, hierarchical leadership that uh, is from top to down, and uh, the people who are uh, delegates uh, uh, in the low level, they do not have any right to, uh, you know, give their opinion or criticize. So such a religion is not compatible with freedom. And also there is a phrase in Arabic, in uh, Islamic doctrine, it says, anam, that means all humanity are, uh, you know, animals, especially when it comes to decision-making. Because when Allah is there, Muhammad is there, people do not have right to make a decision concerning the leadership of the country, you know, uh, political and social values, um, all of them that involve Islam. So wow. that's why and Muslims, especially in the Western societies, they say Islam is the religion of freedom, respect freedom. And uh, they use some of the verses. You know, there are a couple of verses in the Quran. It says there is no compulsion in religion. But they that belongs to Muhammad's first era ministry in Mecca that he didn't have any power. But all chapters, he claimed... Uh, to be coming to him after uh, traveling from Mecca to Medina, all of them are very harsh, and especially the last chapter of the Quran is chapter 9, uh, Surah the Tawba, and the uh, um, Quran is not in chronological order. Chapters are longer, they come first. But chapter 9 is the, you know, Muhammad's uh, deathbed chapter came from all other chapters, after all other chapters. And Islamic law says every revelation comes after, cancels the authority of the revelation came before if they oppose each other in uh, things. Hmm. And so if you read Quran chapter 9, it's just amazing. It says, kill all pagans, and then kill all your family relatives you know, if they are not Muslims. And uh, even young Muslim, immature Muslim children, you know, boys under 12 and girls under 9, in the Quran, Quran 9, chapter 9, are encouraged not to follow their Muslim parents if they are not committed Muslim. That's Quran chapter 9, verse 23. Hmm. And so this is absolutely bizarre. I mean, you cannot say with all these values, you know, with verses in the Quran that, Islam is a religion of peace or uh, respect for freedom. Wow, that is very interesting. Uh, I wonder. Um, I, I always like to get different perspectives from people on what they what they're reading, and um, you know, and, and over and over in the Bible, we see that, as you mentioned, God says, "Come and reason with me," and He says, uh, "Before you, I set death and life. Choose life." He's He's a God of love and a God of choice, because uh, love really cannot exist without free will, without choice. You can't force anyone to love you, um, and you can't, like I said, you can't compel people uh, to love you. So a God of love has to offer us free will and choice, and that's what the God of the Bible does. But apparently, Islam is not like that, as you so (laughs) eloquently put. That that spirit of, uh, you know, uh, freedom, respecting freedom, in Christianity calls the Western countries to boom in everything, and especially in in organizations, because organization as culture is based on individual freedom. So by respecting human autonomy, individual freedoms, workers and delegate freedom, they become creative people. And that calls that the Protestant movement, Hmm. Western countries really to boom in everything. Why Islamic countries are not booming economically, leadership-wise and other things, it's just because of the Islamic values. Wow. Very interesting and a good correlation, a good point there. Um, Friend, you're listening to Divine Intervention Radio. Again, I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, DivineInterventionRadio.com. And we are visiting with our special guest, Dr. Daniel Shiesta. And he uh, is uh, telling us about how he grew up in Iran. And uh, he actually took part in the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Uh, But after that, he fell out of favor with the political leaders and was even imprisoned. And after that... God used that situation to actually bring him to the knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ. And we definitely want to get to that story, and we'll do that right after the break. So, Dr. Shiesta, uh, when we come back, I'd like to hear your story of how uh, you came to know the Lord. 
and uh, what God has been doing with you ever since. So please stay with us. We'll be right back with more of Dr. Daniel Shiesta right here on Divine Intervention Radio. And again, his website is exodusfromdarkness.org. Stay with us. You're listening to Divine Intervention with Daniel Fazina, and we'll return in just a moment. I believe in miracles. Times are tough, not getting easier, but there's an opportunity that could make a significant change in your financial situation. People are paying too much for home utilities, and everybody has them. Help friends and family save money and get paid for it. No obligation. You don't even have to talk to anyone unless you want to. Just listen to a three-minute recorded message. Call now, 715-GET-CASH. That's 715-GET-CASH. Listen, decide, and you could be on your way to a better tomorrow. 715-438-2274. That's 715-GET-CASH. Hey, this is Daniel Fazina of Divine Intervention Radio. The Bible contains some incredible stories of miracles and divine interventions. Jesus calmed a raging storm, healed paralytics, and even raised the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? The answer to this question, as you will see from reading my book, Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today, is an emphatic yes. Contained within the book is a collection of amazing true stories that attest to this fact. You will read the astonishing first-hand accounts of people who have been healed of paralysis, terminal cancer and tumors through prayer. You will see the love of God powerfully transform the life of an Islamic terrorist. You will witness the liberation of the demon-possessed, the resurrection of the dead, and much more. Prepare to be awed and inspired as you experience Divine Intervention. More information about Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today can be found at www.divineinterventionradio.com or by calling 800-247-4784. That's 1-800-247-4784. Hi, this is Chuck Colson. You're listening to Daniel Pazina on Divine Intervention Radio. Welcome back to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina, and our website is divineinterventionradio.com. Also, facebook.com forward slash divine intervention radio. And if you miss any of the archives, uh, they are all there. You can check us out there and on YouTube as well, youtube.com forward slash divine intervention radio. Please do me a favor and go to the website uh, and like and subscribe to the channel. That would really help us to grow the show. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to be encouraged by the many miracle testimonies we have featured there as well. Friend, if you're just joining us, we've been visiting with our special guest, Dr. Daniel Shiesta, and he is from originally Iran, and uh, he was um, a person who took part in the revolution of 1979, uh, only to find out that it wasn't really what he had bargained for, and uh, he fell out of favor with the Iranian authorities, was imprisoned, and then found the Lord, Jesus Christ, uh, through that situation. So, Dr. Daniel Shiesta, welcome back. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. All right. So, tell us now about how you got involved in the politics of Iran, and then uh, you were you know, running for office, I believe, uh, I read in your book, and then you fell out of favor and you were actually imprisoned. Uh, tell us about what happened there. As I mentioned, uh, 
to you that uh, I was one of the first one, you know, uh, one out three that were called to establish the Revolutionary Army after the revolution. But uh, gradually, when I saw the lies of Ayatollah Khomeini, I really didn't show interest. I withdrew from his uh, party. There was a party belonged to the clergy who were surrounding Ayatollah Khomeini. I was a member of that party. I, I withdrew, announced my uh, candidacy for Islamic Parliament as an independent person. And they were so desperate to get me back and actually... They wrote to me uh, several times and also sent uh, a special um, person from their party to encourage me to go back, but I decided not to go back. And uh, that actually caused uh, a pain for uh, uh, my life after that. And in the day of uh, election, I was beaten by chain and uh, fell unconscious in the street. So it was really an anarchic day. Um, they had their uh, people in their street and they just, they knew that if they created chaos and they would, you know, just uh, go to the parliament and uh, send their own people to the parliament. That happened actually, even though the president of the country, the first president was one of my colleagues. He won the, you know, presidency by 88% of people's, uh, you know, vote. Mm. But Ayatollah was the supreme commander of the Revolutionary Army. He three times initi- you know, plotted to kill the president, and eventually the president escaped. And after that, the life became really hell for us, and eventually I was uh, caught and put uh, in, a, in a cell, waiting on death row with four others, actually. And all four were killed, but I was able to escape by the help of some friends who were in very high positions. They were in Ayatollah's group, but they played because we had a long history of friendship and they played some legal games and, uh, you know, games are very popular in Islamic countries. <laughs> I didn't know that. And they released me temporarily and then I realized that was then, so they asked me to escape from the country. So I escaped from the country and uh, went to Turkey. But other four were killed, all four, and many other people in other prisons. They wow. were they were slaughtered. This sounds like a, a f- like a fascist regime. Uh, oh, oh my goodness! It's it, it actually when we speak about fascism, we remember, you know, uh, Hitler or Stalin. But you know, the fascism is a human idea. But when that fascism becomes a godly idea, a theocracy, then nobody dares to break it, and it becomes more horrible than even fascism. Mm. You imagine that, you know, clergy call themselves the most righteous person, but they have permission from Allah even to rape a boy, uh, an opposition man in the prison. That is crazy. And to, to humiliate the person for the glory of Allah, as they say. Wow. It's just very scary, very frightening. When you go there, oh, the only thing can help you is this. You need to count yourself a dead person. That's now, all. when you witness these type of things that were done in the name of Allah, did that cause you to question Islam or Allah? Um, yeah, that was in prison, actually. In prison, okay. we were told that whatever, you know, torture and persecution we were getting is from the Quran and from uh, from the Holy Quran, they were saying that, and from the traditional books uh, from holy leaders. Hmm. In my heart, I said to, to them, in my heart, it didn't tell them because you do not, you know, object whatever they are saying. In my heart, I just said uh, them call them liar but then i said to myself maybe it is written in the quran i mean i never read the quran in my mother language always recited that in arabic didn't know what was written inside it so i i said to myself because only the only available book in the co- in the prison was the quran i said how about if i read that in my mother language because one page was arabic the other page was farsi or persian you're not encouraged at the beginning of Korans are written that don't read the Quran in your mother language, just recite it in Arabic. So that was there in the cor- in the prison. I decided to read the Quran in my mother language, and I was shocked, and I was 
just puzzled week after week for the things I was seeing in the Quran, you know? Mm. The old pains and tortures and the immoralities even are coming from the Quran. There are shocking immoral verses in the Quran that you feel embarrassed to talk about them. Muhammad never got embarrassed to speak about them. And even the translation they do in Persian, in Turkish, in English, they never mention the name that are immoral names that Muhammad has mentioned in the Quran. Hmm. Are they only written in Arabic, those immoral names? It's, it's in Arabic. Yeah, it's in Arabic. It's clear. Arab people who read it, they understand it. But the Persian people or Turkish people, they do not understand it unless you know a little bit of Arabic. So you understand it. Wow. So the stuff you're witnessing is actually in the Quran, and it's uh, justified, I guess, by the Quran. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's a Quran. Quran really, more than sixty percent of the Quran is about killing, hatred, discrimination, and uh, you know, sexuality. You know, especially, you know, uh, having the girls and wives of other non-Muslim as your uh, property. You know, hmm. it's just. More than 60% is about that. More than 300 harsh, terrorizing, killing verses in the Quran. Wow. So this, I guess, uh, made you consider or think about, you know, your your standing as a Muslim, if you really wanted to continue as a Muslim. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, that, that was in prison. I really was disillusioned with Islam because just before that, I was thinking that I was going to die as a a spiritual hero of Islam, and then after that I said, I don't like this religion, I don't like this God. Then it was really torturous for me after that, for whom, for what I am going to die. But I praise the Lord Jesus, even if I didn't know him in that time, <laughs> had a plan for me and saved my life. Amen. Well, I understand that you did escape uh, the country eventually, and you went to Turkey, and that's where you met a group of Christians and, um, you know, God got a hold of you there, which I think is miraculous in itself because Turkey, from what I understand, has a, popu- a Christian population of less than 1%. Um, yeah. So how did that come about? How did this uh, story play out? I would love to hear it. It's an amazing story of God, really. He prepared everything for me. I mean, you know, Turkey had been one of the harshest Islamic country in the history. But in that time, I entered Turkey. Turkey was run by martial law. That army wanted to make Turkey a part of, you know, Western countries and European countries, and therefore there was freedom there to some extent. Okay. So what happened? Turkish is my mother language in Iran, so it's, it's a little bit different. But if you spend a couple of months, you just learn the language perfectly. So I learned university to do my doctorate. The major of my doctorate was about religions, cultures, and philosophical beliefs. I had to compare their religions and cultures and write my thesis in what way they impact human attitudes or what kind of leadership they create or, or family and organizational culture they establish. I there for the first time I was amazed by Christian values and shocked with Islamic values for going deeply into Islamic belief. And so, in every way, I was fascinated by Christianity, especially for leadership values and also individual freedom. And then, after that, you know, um, uh, I had a business partner. Actually, I was a partner to a business, Iranian businessman in Turkey. He took all my money and he escaped Germany, and I couldn't chase him legally. And uh, there was an Iranian Christian group in contact with him. They possibly were working with him to lead him to Christ. But before giving his heart to Christ, he took my money and escaped. Oh, man. <laughs> so, that, so that caused me to go to that Iranian group, their church, and, uh, you know, by the hope of getting some ideas from them so I could relate to the guy in Germany and uh, beg him to give me money, you know. And so I went to the church, and they offered their help to me to find him in Germany. So that caused me to be gradually going to the church, because I didn't have any cell phone in that time, you know, to contact them through cell phone. So I just went to the church. They were only free on Sunday, because in other days they were working. 
Right. So, you know, just just for my money, you know, to get some news from them. But in the meantime, I was hearing their messages. Their message about God was amazing, really, uh, especially philosophically, because I was also teaching philosophy back in Iran. They were saying that God in the Bible is the personal God, and uh, you can have personal relationship with God. That's not the case in Islam or in any other religion. Mm. In Islam, God has, he never reveals himself. He's always behind the veil or, or curtain. The prophet of Islam himself never heard his God, never saw his God, never talked to his God. But these people are saying that God is personal in the Bible. He has created us personally. We are created in his own personal image. And therefore, we have the capacity and capability to have personal relationship with God. And if we allow God to come into our life, we would be, will be united absolutely with God from now to the eternity. Mm. And that made sense to my mind and heart. Yeah, if God is personal, and actually God must be personal, because if God is not personal, he cannot create personal beings. Right. And therefore, if he is personal, if I am personal, so two persons can have relationship with each other. And I said to myself, wow, this is so delicious. This is so yummy. <laughs> and it was really amazing to me, you know, that God, I didn't know, I never thought about it, Islam never thought it, that God is personal. You do not leave your, your salvation for the life after Salvation is the reality of this life. Unity is the reality of this life. It should start from here, continue for eternity. Right. It absolutely showed itself brilliant to me. And I gradually became interested in listening to them more. And then I had a dream, and that dream was amazing. The following Sunday, I heard the dream in the church, you know, from the pulpit, the preacher was speaking. So all of them encouraged me. You know, my university study, their messages, my dream, uh, to read the Bible myself. I first grabbed the New Testament, then I started to read the New Testament. Can you tell us about the dream? What What did the dream uh, say, or what was in the dream? Uh, uh, the dream, actually, is the name of my book that you read it, that the house I left behind. Ah, okay. My dream, in my dream, I was in my father's house, exactly my father's house, but I was alone there. And there was an earthquake, people died, houses were destroyed. It was a, you know, disaster, death everywhere. It was a frightening situation. I cried to God and said, there is no one here to help me. And Jesus revealed himself to me in the dream and said that he'll help me if I leave the house of my father. Hmm. So I left, them. I left the house of my father, went out, my father's house collapsed. I woke and saw it was a dream. The following Sunday, I went to the church. The preacher was speaking about those verses. Jesus said, a wise person doesn't build his house on sand, but on on the solid ground. Wow. In his message, he said to people, come out from your father's house. (laughs) Wow. The exact sentence I heard from Jesus in my dream. The week before. yeah, yeah, a week before. That, that, then I was really shocked. I said, what is happening here? Am I dreaming another one here? So, <laughs> so did you realize that was the true God speaking to you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, not yet, but I was shocked. I said, what's happening here? There is, there is something happening here. I need to read their book. So that was after that I started to read the Gospel. Gospel is an amazing God philosophy books among all other religions books in the world. Hmm. That will not not only reveal God to you, but put your hand in the hands of God. Gospel has amazing, powerful, influential philosophical passages in itself. Like like John chapter one is a is an absolute powerful philosophy. It starts with philosophy. God is word. You know, the word became flesh. Word is the definition of God in all other religions, philosophy. It is? Characteristic. The characteristic of word is different in other religions compared to the Bible. In all other religions, the word 
God is unknown, is uh-huh. non-relational, is impersonal, non-revealing, not functional. But in the Bible, the word became flesh because it, he is personal, he is functional. If God says, I love you, love only can make sense between two personal beings. Right. You do not say to air, I love you. You see something, you fall in love with that thing, and then you express your love. God is the same. He revealed himself to you and to say to you, I love you, so you can understand and sense that love. Mm. So amazing, amazing, really. I love it. So what was the point where you actually decided, hey, I want to follow Jesus now. I want to leave my father's house behind. Yeah. First of all, Jesus manifests, reveals the true God to you. The true God, I'm saying that, absolutely righteous, absolutely holy, absolutely loving and kind. In Islam, God cannot be absolutely righteous or just or holy because Allah is the creator of evil and sin too. Sin is coming from Allah, you know, Hmm. in the Quran. Like pagans believe that Allah is, Allah corrupts. Satan. In the Quran is written, chapter 7, verse 16, Quran, you know, that verse says, Allah corrupted Satan. Allah made Satan, you know, uh, the angel of corruption. Hmm. It's a pagan belief. How can a holy God create corruption if there is no any essence of corruption in his nature? That's it's a good question. Absolutely a bizarre philosophy. You know? Yeah. And so that was the first thing. Jesus revealed the God to you that He doesn't create sin or corruption. Corruption is coming from the rebellion of Satan. After that, you know, the world became corrupt. But in Islam, Allah's nature is the creator of sin. That cannot be a true God. It's a man made in the image of God. So that's philosophically speaking and doctrinally. And also, when you come to the other aspects of life, politically, socially, I mean, Allah is a dictator God. Jesus says the greatest of you should be the servant of all. Right. You have to respect the autonomy of other people, the humanity of other people. That absolutely is missing in Islam. And also, seeing non moslems as your enemy, you have to kill them, you know, in Islam. It's bizarre how. How God, you know, creates people um, hostile toward each other, you know, makes them sinners, makes them vicious to kill each other. And such a God does not exist. That's not the God of the Bible. No. Key distinction. These were the major issues caused me to give my heart to Jesus, especially... Jesus believes that only love can bring people together. This is not only spiritual, that's logical too. You have to respect people, you have to show kindness to them in order to become their friend. You don't go to them and say to them, I hate you, but I want to become your friend. That doesn't make sense. Right. And that Islam, with that hostility, Islam cannot be peaceful and have peace with other people. Now, Islam, uh, many times I've heard that uh, they say either you convert or you're killed or you have to pay a a tax to to remain a non-Muslim in a Muslim country or you're cast out of your family if you 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 decide to follow Christ or you're killed. Um, What was the case in your situation with your family and your society? I mean, once you became a believer, was there a, a price you had to pay for that? Yeah, well, we scared our family to death in Iran because um, after that, uh, an obligation comes uh, to the family to get rid of you. Otherwise, they put themselves in problem without such an action. And so um, I got a death threat from one of the family members. He wrote to me and said, it's a godly obligation. If we catch you, we need to kill you. I didn't respond to him and after several years, and he saw the situation in Iran, and he realized, and then he called me and cried and uh, apologized me. But I had the threats, you know, uh, from, you know, out of the country, from Europe, from Africa, and uh, from America. But, uh, you know, by God's grace, um, my time hasn't finished yet, and uh, I'm here living now. 
And I believe that he is sovereign God, that if he has a plan for me, nobody is able to kill me until my time comes. <laughs> Amen. I certainly believe that as well, and I'm very glad that you're still here to tell the story and be able to share it uh, with our listeners here on Divine Intervention. Um, if there's someone listening to this right now who maybe is a Muslim, uh, maybe they're questioning whether Allah is there or whether he's real, uh, what would be your encouragement to that person? I really, really encourage Muslims to read the Gospel and read the Quran and compare them with each other. Muslims do not know what is written in their Quran, honestly. And the, the things written inside the Quran even doesn't match their culture. Their culture is very, very nicer than the culture of the Quran. And so they do not have knowledge. And I, I, honestly, I came face to face even with Imams who do not know the Quran. And it's, it's amazing. And uh, so they need to really listen to, uh, you know, Christian messages, read the Gospel, and compare it with the Quran. And, uh, you know, just simply I want to tell Muslims, they believe that God is mighty, mightier than Satan. Muslims believe that Satan is everywhere, is trying to, you know, corrupt people and separate them from God. My question is this, is God weaker than Satan to save people instead of leaving them for the life after? God is free, more free than Satan. He can work here in this life to save people from the bondage of Satan. And also if God is the source of absolute love, an absolute loving God never leaves the unity with people for the life after. A girl and boy, they fall in love with each other. They never say to one another, let us marry in the life after. Hmm. Why they don't do that? Because unity is the reality of this life. The spiritual unity is the same. The prophet of Islam didn't know about his own future. Quran says nobody knows about the future. That Quran cannot be from, from God. God is the God of unity. His heart is beating every second for unity for Muslim, with Muslims and all over the world. And so these are the logical realities we Muslims really need to think about it. And to listen to people like me that have come from that background and have ample reasons for every you know, aspect of life. And I really humbly ask Muslims to open their ears and eyes and read and compare. That's good advice, and uh, friend, if that's you, I highly encourage you to take Dr. Daniel Shiesta's advice and uh, read the Gospels and c compare them with the Quran, as he said. Dr. Shiesta, I really appreciate your insights, and uh, I appreciate you sharing your story here on Divine Intervention Radio, and I thank you for the work you're doing. Once again, Dr. Daniel Shiesta, thank you so much, sir, and God bless you. It's my pleasure. God bless you, too. Well, friend, that about does it for another exciting episode of Divine Intervention Radio. Again, our special guest has been Dr. Daniel Shiesta. You can get his website info at exodusfromdarkness.org. And I highly recommend you pick up a copy of his book, The House I Left Behind, A Journey from Islam to Christ. It is a very interesting read. He's got a, a, an amazing background. Uh, not every day you talk to someone who experienced the revolution in Iran and went from uh, you know, a practicing Muslim to a follower of Jesus. So do check out the book. We're going to put a link to it on our website, divineinterventionradio.com. And uh, God willing, we will see you again next time for another uh, riveting story of how God has changed someone's life. He is changing the world one heart at a time. Thanks so much. Take care and God bless. You've been listening to Divine Intervention with your host, Daniel Fazina. You can email Daniel at divineintervention at mail.com. That's divineintervention at mail.com. All programs of Divine Intervention are available online at divineinterventionradio.com. That's divineinterventionradio.com. Join us next time here on Divine Intervention. Yeah.